I'd like to open the seminar by um, doing an acknowledgement of country. So um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we are all streaming into this seminar from this evening. Um, so for me here in Victoria um, and based in Melbourne, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present as well as acknowledging future and emerging cultural leaders. Um, I'd also like to extend that respect to any Indigenous identifying person that may be joining us this evening or those that, that may also be viewing uh, this recording back at a later time. Um, honestly, I'm pretty thrilled tonight to, to be um, introducing our, our speaker, um, Dr. Matea Rauder, who is, is doing a, her presentation this evening on towards developing evaluation criteria, a conversation about chosen values, excuse me. Um, so Matea is a hugely experienced evaluator. Um, I know she's probably known to, to many of you um, on the seminar this evening. Uh, I believe she's had 20 years experience um, in evaluation, which is, which is pretty incredible and is currently a senior consultant at Ellen and Clark. Um, she's focused a lot on social sector evaluations in New Zealand, Australia and the Pacific Islands um, and of course developing defensible criteria for public sector evaluations was the focus of her PhD research um, and I know she's going to be drawing on, on that this evening. Um, Matea has also been involved with the AES for a number of years, which I did want to acknowledge um, as well, Matea, and in 2010 she actually won the Best Evaluation Study Award. Uh, with colleagues from at Value Research. So I'm really quite thrilled that, that she's agreed to, to be our first seminar speaker of, of 2022. And I wanna hand over to you, Matea, to, to start us off. And just also noting to people, please feel free to post mm. comments and questions in the chat as we go. Matea is happy to, to also take those questions as she, as she goes through her presentation. So um, feel free to use the chat uh, to record your comments. Thank you, Matteo. Hmm. Thanks, Ruth. Um, and kia ora koutou to everybody. I'm um, on, um, well, I'm in New Zealand. Um, I'm in Whanganui Atara, which is Wellington. Um, and today, uh, the government announced, the New Zealand government announced that the borders of, have opened to Australian residents. So I thought it was appropriate that I put a beautiful picture of um, uh, New Zealand up there so hopefully encouraging you to come I don't know it seems like an unreal thing to be traveling again but um, very welcome so to, um, tonight um, so tonight it's 7 30 in New Zealand um, I'm going to be talking about an aspect of evaluation that is central to our practice um, and it's a, a part of um, evaluation that I think is still not that well understood. Um, so I'm hoping that together we'll have a conversation about it. Um, please, there are no dumb questions, all, all questions, comments and thoughts are welcome. So I encourage you to um, put your ideas down in chat and, um, and we'll just stop the presentation and see where we get to. Um, as well as values not being very well understood, I think there are still not that many tools uh, to help practitioners uh, through um, the development of criteria. Um, so I will be sharing um, a, sharing some a, a tool that I developed as part of my PhD. Um, I will start by um, talking about some basic evaluation concepts, uh, which may well be known to most of you, I don't know. Um, and then we'll talk about the tool, the tool and practice, and then moving beyond the tool to um, developing uh, criteria. So my part um, of the presentation of the, sorry, my part, the tool is the first step in developing criteria. and. And just a little bit about that word um, or that term chosen values, that's from Jennifer Green. And she made a comment once that evaluative judgments are anchored in chosen values. 
So if I leave you with one message tonight, it's that you cannot do evaluation without um, attending to values. You know, it's not enough to just collect data. You need to think about the values um, against which you're going to be um, anchoring your evidence or and um, coming up with an evaluative judgment. So hopefully this makes more sense. Um, so this is the logic of evaluation. This underpins every evaluation, whether you are um, doing a personal evaluation about you know, your holiday or um, whether you're doing an evaluation or a professional evaluation of a policy or a program or whatever it is that you do in your, in your day job. Um, so there are four parts to the, the logic. Um, the first one is um, that criteria define what good ought to look like. Um, and we sometimes refer to criteria as what matters. Um, or chosen values. So different words all mean the same thing. It's the thing that is most important um, in a program that you need to consider when you're um, developing your evaluation plan and thinking about um, what evidence you're going to be collecting. The second part is about levels of performance or standards, so it's or a rate, rating. So if you think about, um, for example, a holiday, um, and, your, and your chosen values might be that you go somewhere where, it, where it's warm, um, so temperature's really important, and you might have um, a level of performance, which is that it, at a minimum it needs to be 30 degrees, but you don't want it to be too hot, so. 50 degrees is um, not great, but neither is 15 degrees. So ideally what you're looking for is a comfortable but warm temperature. And then what you do is you collect your evidence. So your evidence is what is happening in practice. Um, so you gather data, um, and in this case you might go on a holiday um, and blast, it's raining and it's 15 degrees. So you're comparing your evidence against what you value, which is a, in this case, you know, 30 degree temperature, sunshine. Um, and you and and you so you're comparing your evidence against your values to reach an evaluative judgment. Um, now I just want to stop there and ask if if that's sort of clear to everybody. Um, and something that you have come across before. Anybody got any questions about that? No? No questions in the chat, Matea, but okay. we have some thumbs up. Okay, all right. Okay, so, um, so just thinking about, you know, even a, a basic activity like going to the supermarket and when you're thinking about what to buy inherently or in, implicitly you will have criteria in your head about what it is that you're looking for and that's based on your personal values the, the challenge um, when we're doing a professional evaluation is to think about um, um, the values that you're going to put in place against which you're going to make an evaluative judgment. So for a program, so you need, you know, the stake, the stakes are higher. You need to think um, a little bit more systematically and carefully about whose values and what values you're going to include. So this is a tool um, that um, will, that is called a values identification matrix. And what it's intended to do is surface um, what's important or what matters. Um, 
And it, rather than just taking, say, the client's values at face value, it's a tool for systematically working through all the different perspectives that might be at play for a particular context. Um, and there are two parts to it. So the, down in the column on the left-hand side, you can see um, interest groups. So what you're needing to do is identify um, all the interest, all the people or entities, because it could be a forest or a sea. Um, so all the entities that have a key vested interest in the initiative um, that you're going to evaluate. Um, so it could be the funder, it could be the providers, it could be, and it should include those most affected by the program. And then along um, in the rest of the matrix are different perspectives. Um, and I've listed four key kind of perspectives that are based in theory around value. So the first one is around consequences. So what's most important is the outcome in a sense. So, you know, that that concept of best bang for buck or what matters is you get, um, get certain outcomes from your program is considered really important. Um, and then the second one is about obligations or duty. So things like contractual obligations um, that that interest group might have to um, support that initiative. The third one I think is quite familiar to many of us, um, and that's about rights and equity and fairness. So what's important is that you abide by certain um, rights that you enact them um, and for a particular interest group that these things are being considered. And then the last one comes out of a out of that ethic of care. So it's about caring and relationships. So what's important is that you're taking um, into account um, things like collaboration or relationships or taking care of other interest groups. Um, so uh, what do I want to say about that? Um, yes, yeah, so the, the, the values identification matrix is intended to be a practical tool um, and you can use it retrospectively um, or you can use it as part of your evaluation scoping. Um, and the idea is to, you know, if you've already got a set of criteria, you can use it to map against the matrix and then think, you know, okay, well, we seem, seem to have a lot about outcomes or, or we seem to have a lot in terms of one particular interest group and what they value, but what about the other groups? Um, so it's a, it's a an opportunity for you really to um, check that you have all the relevant um, uh, values, all the relevant perspectives on what matters for this particular context. And it may be that um, one particular perspective um, is not relevant to a particular interest group and that's okay, at least you've checked it. So, so it's, it's just a tool, um, to check that you, you are taking care of all the values in a particular program that you're going to be evaluating. Have we got any questions there about that tool? I'm going to, I'm next, I'm going to show you an example of the tool um, in an evaluation. So I'll just wait in case. There is a comment by Jerry. Um, I'm not sure if, if you may perhaps want to elaborate on that, Jerry, I know it was a comment rather than the question, but um, would you would you like to, him to elaborate or them to elaborate? Mateo? Yeah.
or you could read the comment. Okay, um, please feel free to interrupt me, <laughs> uh, Jerry, if you want to, to clarify. So the, the comment was, uh, um, Jerry was saying they've been taught by A, values must be absolute or relative, B, evidence must be based on, may be based on, excuse me, observation, logic, and slash or authority. And C, values are often multiple and conflicting. Hmm. Um, and he was just, they were just saying that they're listening to explore how they uh, were taught and, and could use your framework in their practice. So um, that was, I thought, an in interesting observation that you may want to respond to, Matea. Um, I'm going to respond to the, the one about, the, about values being um, often conflicting. Um, so one of the things that I have found um, this tool useful for is A to C, eyeball where the values are uh, conflicting. How you deal with that, um, we could come back to in another, in another perhaps later, later on. But um, um, so it, it's really important to understand that, um, yep, not everybody will have the same values, but it, by the same token, you may identify that um, different interest groups do have similar values as well. Um, they might um, understand them in a different way. And if I go to the next slide, um, I hope people can see this, but you'll see, um, and I, if I move my cursor, do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is so just by example, in this, um, this is an evaluation of a funding um, project that happened in New Zealand that I was part of eva evaluating it um, last year, and um, three billion dollars was pumped into local communities. Um, with the idea that it would spark some regional development. And most of these local communities and regions had been starved of any government, central government funding for about 40 years. Um, so the idea was to um, get projects underway. Um, and these were large and small projects. And it also had a very strong focus on Māori, so indigenous communities. And um, if you look at um, just this column here, you'll see that um, what was important for regional government and for funded applicants, sometimes funded applicants were also regional government, so I've pulled them into one uh, interest group. And for them, what was important is that priority projects were funded and were getting underway, that the money actually went to the region and the projects were starting to get built. Um, so projects like cycle paths and um, irrigation projects and um, roundabouts. And then you'll see for the indigenous communities, it was similar. Priority projects were funded and underway. So, um, but then you'll also see across here that there are some different values. So, for example, um, in this last column around relationships, I'll just have to move you out of the way. Um, it's nuanced. So, what was important for regional government is that central government was having a relationship with regional government. For indigenous communities, they wanted um, central government to be working well and in ways that um, um, fit with their own cultural values. Um, and for government, they were interested in collaboration as well, but it was primarily around collaboration across different government agencies. So they wanted um, a connectedness to happen between different agencies. So the idea is that um, uh, you surface what's important for each um, of the interest groups. 
And the interest, interest groups um, in this case, um, I've, I've just grouped them into three because that, would all, that was all that would fit onto this page. Um, and if we, if we go through it, um, you'll see the nuance, the different, so the consequences is all about outcomes, you know, strong economic performance, um, projects getting, so outputs, projects getting funded and underway, um, youth being trained, whereas the obligations column is about um, projects being completed on time and within budget, so meeting contractual obligations um, and that, you know, the decision, decision making was allocated in line with the objectives of the initiative and that the contracting process was simple and accessible. Um, and in terms of fairness and equity, uh, for the regional government, um, they, what they wanted was a transparent process for deciding regional projects. So the, they didn't want a um, completely top-down process. They wanted uh, to be able to make their own decisions about which projects would be prior to prioritised. And they also wanted it to be fair for everybody in the community to have access to the funding if they met the criteria. Um, for Indigenous communities, um, and the, they were interested in um, the rights of natural resources. So in New Zealand, we have some natural resources like rivers that have um, the rights of a person. So they wanted those rights to be upheld. And they didn't want projects to reinforce existing inequities. So, for example, uh, with some irrigation projects, um, the irrigation would be in place, but there'd be quite a high uh, cost to accessing the irrigation. That meant that uh, rich farmers could access it, but small um, indigenous communities were not able to access the, the same irrigation. Um, and then in terms of care and relationships, um, so mostly this was about relationships. Um, in one sense, you could say that the health and well-being of natural resources is about also about care. And I don't think it really matters where you put stuff. It's more about the different perspectives being a prompt for you to think, now what matters here for this group? Um, so any questions about that? Yeah. Okay, we did have two, two questions we, we didn't quite cover off on the last break. Yep, sorry. Um, no, no, that's, that's all right. Ian, um, we missed your hand being raised. I don't know if you had a question or comment you wanted to share? Uh, yes, I did. Thank you very much for, for noticing that. Uh, I was hoping that this table was going to answer my question. That's why I put my uh, hand back down. But <clears throat> what I'm interested in, and I've got a bit of a financial background, so I know that finance and cash drives so many things, along with electoral votes. I've never seen either of those two aspects actually spelled out in these sorts of tables before, and I wonder how they fit. So an example would be, um, let's say I had, oh, I think the figure was 3 billion, right? So the figure was 3 billion, and it'd be interesting to know how much went to Indigenous communities and how much that is duplicated in the regional government area as well, which would become a, a, a problem to, to deal with. Um, so I understand all of the theory of this, but when push comes to shove, nine times out of ten, it's the almighty dollar that ends up ruling that ruling the answers and and sort of a platitudes towards those who who have less inequity by 0.0001% mm. than they had before to, to meet the political taskmasters. I, I've ragged on, but it, it, any comment along that sort of line, I'd be interested to see how. The three billion in this sort of project worked out. And you might be able to refer me to a to a report or something. But thank you for for that. Thanks, Ian. Uh, well, there is a, a report 
Um, I didn't include it in the list of references, but um, I'm happy to share it later. Um, I guess my response is that, um, well, the report did unpack how much went to Māori projects as opposed to non-Māori projects. Um, and we know that the money went into particular regions. So we'd be able to see how much went into a region and how much of that went into and, uh, projects that were tagged as particular Indigenous projects. It, I mean, obviously there are regional projects that are mainstream in a sense and might um, attract uh, Indigenous youth into training or employment, and they wouldn't be picked up in those stats. But it's a, the tool is really a way of making sure that those most impacted by an initiative have what's, of, what's important for them included in um, the evaluation. So, so the way that you would use this having surfaced what's important for different stakeholders, including government, um, is that you would then write your questions um, and, your, and then having written your questions, so one of your questions might be, if we look, go to the next page, for example. Okay, so this is actually from the report. And I, we didn't write the questions. The questions were given to us. But we've got a question around how well the design and approach has been actioned to maximise the changes needed to achieve the desired impact. Um, and you'll see that the criteria from the previous page, so if I go back to this, can't go back. Um, but you'll, you'll remember that there was collaboration and pre-application and decision-making and contracting and client management. So we looked at those things. But within those criteria, we also had um, a particular focus on, say, Indigenous um, values as well. And for this evaluation, so the way that we understood collaboration was based on what was valued by the different stakeholders. And then we looked at how that played out for those different stakeholders. Um, for this evaluation, we actually had a bar. So if it didn't work very well for our Indigenous population, then a rating, the rating could not be higher than consolidating. Um, so this is going beyond... Um, what the values identification matrix will give you, but I just wanted to show you how we use this um, when we had done our analysis. So, you know, we collected our data. These were our criteria. Um, we understood the criteria in a particular way based on what was valued. And um, that included the values of government. They, of course, they were very happy to share their policy documents mm -hmm. and as key stakeholders' um, perspectives and what was valued. But we also asked those communities um, in the regions and Indigenous populations. Um, so, um, so this is this is what this is how it played out. Um, now, I don't know if that answers your question. Right. I'm happy. Does? Okay. Any other questions about? Mateo, we do have um, two questions from France here, which I think you possibly partly answered in response to Ian. But um, they've asked, does the values identity identification matrix have to be completed by stakeholders? Can it be done on their behalf mm -hmm. and still be right. valid? Great question. So... I use, I wish I could go backwards. Oh, there we go. Okay, so you'll see here that I use the term interest groups and I differentiate between interest groups and stakeholders. So what you're doing here is identifying who has um, a vested interest in a program 
to get the information about what people value, you can go to a number of different sources. So you might have a needs assessment. Um, you'll have most definitely probably have policy documents and contractual documents. Um, you might talk to the people who are most impacted. Um, you might draw on subject or cultural experts. And then you might have literature from previous research or previous evaluations. There might, other be, might be other sources that you draw on. Um, so you're using those sources, not just the stakeholders, to identify what's of value. So all of those sources will be useful in surfacing what's of value for a particular interest group. Um, so in, in many evaluations that I've done in my practice, um, at the scoping phase, what we've done is um, government stakeholders have told us what is important for them. You know, we'll do some key stakeholder interviews. Um, often there's hardly any time to ask anybody else. Um, you might look at a bit of literature. But the, the idea is that um, you know, if you're going to do a systematic analysis of what matters against which you're going to be then collecting data and getting to your evaluative ju judgment, then you need to think very carefully about who you talk with, where you, which sources are um, uh, warranted, you know, obviously with your literature, you might be thinking about um, literature, you know, I'm working on an evaluation at the moment where we privilege Indigenous literature, um, so Indigenous authors over other public health authors from, you know, World War Health Organization or wherever. Um, so, in each context, it will be really different, but it's really careful, caref really important that you warrant your sources. You don't take them at face value. Um, so, and sorry, that was a, a bit of a lecture. Sorry, Francis. <laughs> Does that answer the question or not? Ask me the question again. Yes, I said yes, Matea. Okay. Um, <laughs> just wanted to say yes, and no apologies for the lecture. It was wonderful. Not a lecture at all. Very helpful. Okay. Well, I didn't really want to lecture. I would much rather that this is a chat. So if anybody else has a comment or a different perspective, please speak up. David um, has just shared a comment in the chat box. He said, I'm interested in how you came up with a list of four value categories. I did a quick Google and found over 100 values. So, um, if I told you where I got these categories from, I thought I would scare you all away. Um, so, in philosophy, and I warn you, in philosophy, there are basically three ways that you can categorize values. Um, there is something called deontology, deontological perspective, which is consequences. So what matters is the outcome. How you get there is of less um, consequence. Yeah, what's important is that you focus on just getting good outcomes. Um, and that wasn't deontology. Sorry, I got that wrong. That's a consequentialist perspective. The, the obligations comes out of a perspective called deontology. So that's, that's a, another rule-based way of thinking about what matters. 
Um, and what matters is that you always do the right thing, that it's um, that you abide by rules or regulations or uh, contracts. So, you know, um, if we think about this example here, it's that you get things done on time, within budget, um, that you report to government at a particular time. Um, so all of those things come out of this deontological perspective. And then we have um, another perspective in which rights and equity and fairness are grouped. Um, which is that, you know, you it, it, it's not rule-based, it's about um, particular things that are important, like human rights or animal rights, or that equity, or that you're fair in a particular circumstance. Um, and then um, the last one comes out of an ethic of care perspective, um, and that's had a lot of, uh, there's a lot of literature in recent years that's come out of the feminist, um, from feminist writers, which is about care and relationships. And in New Zealand, um, with, ind with indigenous communities, you'll often see that that is what's most important. So there is a, a saying here that um, what's most what's most important it's the people the people the people so you get the relationships right and everything else falls into place don't worry about outcomes don't worry about rules and regulations don't worry about anything else um, what's most important is that you are in relationship with others and looking after others um, and there is a crossover between them so um, don't get too hung up about where those different perspectives sit it's most important that you just start to think about the fact that there are more than one way um, to think about what's important so if we go to this slide um, you know if you if you were using um, the values identification matrix at the beginning of an evaluation, um, you could have a series of questions around those three or four different perspectives. And um, they could inform uh, your stakeholder interviews or what you look for in the literature around surfacing what's of value. Does that? Help, David. Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like yeah. to challenge you on the fact that there are many, many, many different ways. I think they all boil down to which, which I think is quite useful. I mean, who wants to think about thousands of different ways of what you value? If you can categorise them into three or four ways, um, I think we can m manage to wrangle them into something. I wasn't suggesting you shouldn't have four categories. I was curious about how you came to categorise them. So yeah. You've answered that really well. Thank you. Yeah, so something that I didn't mention is that the values identification matrix is grounded in philosophical perspectives that go back, you know, a gazillion years. Um, and also the tool... Um, has empirically been tested so it's it's a tool it's only one but it does have a bit of theoretical grunt behind it um so me and aristotle's Aris, Aris, whatever his name is plato okay um any other questions or comments Just, just one comment, additional comment. Oh, and now another question. So maybe I'll go to Marianthe's question. Um, they've asked, did you explicitly discuss the use of the values identification matrix with key stakeholders? How was it received and what feedback did you get? Uh, another good question. No, I used this matrix in retrospect. So 
with this particular client, as often happens, I don't know, certainly in New Zealand, we were given um, several key evaluation questions, each of which had a dozen questions under them, so sub-questions, which um, if you looked at them, um, had implicit criteria in them. Um, and then they also had criteria. So this client, client particularly wanted a, um, a strong evaluation um, framework, evaluative framework with evaluative reasoning, um, but they had the criteria in place. So we, we used it to check in this particular circumstance. And I don't know that you even need to use it um, explicitly with clients. I mean, it's, it's really just about keeping these questions in mind, thinking about who are the, who, who are the interest groups beyond government or whoever the funder of the evaluation is. Um, where am I going to find out really what matters for these groups and then however you you know however you decide to do it it may be a matrix or it just might be um, a literature review or whatever an exercise in identifying what matters and then you know doing an exercise like this where you grow, you pull them up into a set of criteria um, and just you just you know when you're developing your criteria there's a couple of things that you need to think about one is that they are quite separate that they're not overlapping um, and that they're they are defined at the same level so that you're um, you're not looking at a sub category of a criterion so you get, can get yourself into a bit of bother if you do that so so it's, it's it's just a checking of you know these are the key things that we need to be thinking about um, in this case we already had evaluation questions around all of these aspects um, but I'm working on an evaluation at the moment um, in also, it also has an uh, indigenous context in Australia, whoops, where we've identified criteria. So one of the exercises that we did in our first round of data gathering was to ask um, people, indigenous communities, what matters, what matters in terms of um, primary health care for them. And that has surfaced um, criteria that were not included in our original set of questions. So there is some overlap, but there were things there that matter to them that were not in the original program logic or the questions or the way that primary health care was being um, articulated by the federal government. So um, we didn't, in that case, use values identification matrix um, but what we did do was make sure that we had a specific piece of work around identifying what was important for those that were most affected by the initiative so however you do it what's most important is that you um, surface all the relevant criteria um, and just coming back to a question um, that somebody had earlier on about um, what you do when you've got criteria that are really uh, um, at odds with each other. I mean, there are, and feel free to add to the conversation, but one way I've seen that done is to report on the different perspectives. So, you know, if it was collaboration and a particular thing was important for a particular interest group, you'd report, you know, and it, for this group, it worked very effectively. So that's your 
evaluative judgment, but for another group um, who value something different, um, it was not effective. So you might say for this group, what was important was this. Um, and when we looked at the evidence, that wasn't happening. So it's not effective for that group. Alternatively, you might decide that one particular interest group is prioritized over another and then go through a process of um, prioritizing how you uh, reach your evaluative judgment. So you might set up something to, similar to what we did where you set a bar. So if it's not working for a particular group, then it automatically brings the rating down. This feels like a very one-sided conversation. I don't have any more questions yet or comments yet, but they have it. Um, oh, we've got a hand, Jackie. Oh. Matei, thank you so much for your presentation so far. It's very thought provoking for me. I'm curious if, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to articulate this, it's just come to me, but is, is there a sweet spot when it comes to how many criteria you develop? I feel like I, I could potentially, you know, develop hundreds, which would become unworkable. Do you kind of have, and I'd, I'd like your point about make sure that they're clearly defined and at the same level. But in your experience, have you found, is there kind of a nice number or is it just too context dependent? Mm -hmm. um, I think you do want to try to group it up if you can, um, but it might depend on the context and the evaluation. Um, I'm, the evaluation that I'm working on, on in the Indigenous Australian context, we're just starting to develop our evaluation, having done that first piece of work to identify what people value. And um, for each evaluation question, we've probably got about eight to 10 criteria. criteria or um, And we have grouped it up. So what we've done there is use the key evaluation question as the main criterion. So take, so made it more explicit. So um, the, the key evaluation question is something around, you know, um, does this, and, you know, to what extent does this program um, work well, for example, for, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And then that concept of working well has, um, say, eight dimensions. And then each of those dimensions is described based on the data that we've got from what people say they value. So it's layered. Um, so in fact, we've only got one criterion, which is that the program's working well, but then there are sub criteria, like or dimensions or components. And then each of those is described. So we're unpacking these kind of nebulous terms. Um, and what's most important is that in the unpacking, it's not the evaluator's interpretation of what that term means. It's transparently coming from um, a place, another place. In this case, mostly what people tell us is what's important. Um, does anybody else want to add anything? I just want to acknowledge my colleague, Brendan. I didn't realize he was gonna be coming. So Brendan um, was a co um, evaluator on this evaluation that are, that is up on the screen at the moment, and he might want to add something about how we how we got to the evaluative judgments. Can I play with Mateo? I mean, yeah, 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 great. It's uh, wonderful to hear you sort of talking, you know, speaking your your VIM truth. Um, <laughs> And I, I love philosophy too. I was thinking about. Um, 
critical realism and how you're unpacking the mechanisms and structures that we can't see, which which hold these values, which are often cultural. But going back to your point about setting a bar for value, because I think that's such a key thing. Often we, in doing these evaluations, you know, the most the most the smallest groups who often they um, the um, often don't get seen these evaluations because there's no way of moving their um, priorities up in the evaluation. Um, so this idea of prioritizing the most vulnerable, but the smaller populations, because they obviously, you know, there's not as much money spent on them. So they're not as expensive in, in an evaluation versus a general population with huge numbers, but only a marginal impact on them. So it's this balancing of small populations, but big effects versus a big population with small effects in that way of um, using your your value matrix to try and bring those voices up to bring some balance into it is a really was really useful so kia ora kia ora that's me <laughs> unless, you, unless you want me to talk about thanks brendan else. thanks brendan <laughs> yeah i mean that's the wonderful thing about working with colleagues who don't necessarily come from an evaluative perspective um, one of the challenges that we're going through with our um, indigenous evaluation in Australia at the moment is how to explain this approach to, to colleagues um, that don't necessarily come from an evaluation background. Um, and things that come to mind and, and challenges for me are um, how do we make sure that it doesn't become a reductionist process? Um, when you, you know, because very often in real life, everything is connected. So when you break it down to its components, what does it, what do you lose and how do you make sure that you hold the whole? Um, so that's one of the challenges that I have. Very keen to hear any perspectives on that. There is a couple of, of extra comments in the chat box, Matea. Um, so perhaps I might just take the last two two questions there. Um, Marianthi was just responding to, to your comments, Brendan, saying um, the intersection of evaluation slash ethics and perhaps advocacy. So I think that was a comment rather than a question. Um, but Michael has just asked, how do uh, we manage the situation where what people say is important to them so where what people say is important to them is different from other sources such as existing literature or other sources of evidence you were sharing on your slide, Matea. Um, I don't think it matters that you have different perspectives. The whole purpose of this is to see that different perspe perspectives exist and then you've got, you're forced to um, think about how in your evaluation you're going to hold on to those different perspectives. Um, are you going to privilege certain perspectives? Um, are you going to report on the different perspectives and then what the evidence says and what that might mean? Um, uh, anybody else want to add anything? Amy's just posted a comment. I don't know if you want to speak to it, Amy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tapping well, you. I can. It's just that I think sometimes we the, we we treat the literature as an authority, but fundamentally it might be biased as well, depending on who did the study and and if it was an evaluation that only privileged funders and not the perspectives of the community. So I think it, it's a way. That's why I think the matrix is so valuable because it puts that against. Um, you know, the, what's actually true for this particular evaluant in this particular context, which um, mm. may be different from the literature, but it also might be that the what happened in the literature had some inherent bias that wasn't identified. Mm. So I think in your evaluation, 
uh, what's important is that you think about the sources that inform what's of value. Um, so, you know, are they a subject expert in this particular context? And what we have found with um, this public, this um, primary health project in Australia is that um, what health experts overseas say is important is not necessarily what the indigenous population say. So when you gather um, a whole lot of data across Australia on what different um, indigenous communities say is important and you analyse that, that's um, a strong perspective. Um, and actually, with that particular data, there were, were there was very even though they're very very different communities, um, and we know that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities um, are very different. What they were saying um, was pretty much identical. So that's a strong um, warranted perspective on what's important for them for the, in terms of primary health care um, and we would privilege that data um, over any literature that we were reading and of course it's um, we also looked at the literature and, and then again also privileged um, indigenous Australian authors to understand what they were saying and how it might be different. There's um, one question here from Gary that I think maybe extends this conversation a little bit. Um, they've asked, whose values matter most? Is there a risk that some teens will consciously perhaps, question mark, grant more matter to the view of a funding body so the team can be in the running for another evaluation job. Yeah. Well, that's an ethical question. <laughs> um, So I don't know if I'm going to be able to able to answer this, but as part of my PhD, I did a review of evaluations in Australia and New Zealand, and there happened to be several evaluations of the same initiative in Australia. Um, and it was very interesting to see um, how some of those evaluation companies took, and they were exactly the same criteria that the government, different, the government, um, federal government or state governments used. Um, um, however, some, well, one, one or two of the evaluation companies um, dug deeper into the criteria and the way that they understood value and also critiqued it. Um, so I think it's very nuanced. It's a very vague way of saying that. I do think that some evaluations are very um, superficial and basically give government what not, not so much what they want, but they stick to the prescribed questions and the criteria, interpret them in a particular way, whereas other evaluators will take it to the next level and think about it from different perspectives. But I think we all know that. And that's the, that's the value of, um, I guess, having multidisciplinary teams. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a challenging one. Um, Amy and Brendan have the hand. Brendan, is that a new hand or a previously raised hand? <laughs> it's an old oh. hand, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a um, legacy hand. <laughs> Mate, I'm curious about how, so it sounds like in this one that you're talking about as an example, 
might be a, a hidden answer to Jerry's question because you they gave you a set of criteria then you went and you asked indigenous communities what mattered to them and there were difference so how did you persuade the client to accept those indigenous things instead of just using their own set um, we haven't finished the evaluation. Um, however, the way we set up the evaluation is that we said that, so there is an evaluation question about how well is, is the initiative working for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? And the first step was to understand what's of value for those people so it, it's it's set up set up clearly in the way that we have set out the evaluation um and i guess there you know we we all know that there are ways to bring the client along the journey so we'll be doing that um i don't i don't uh, you know, I want to. I, I hope there's no federal government people here, but they're pretty clueless about um, what's of value because they don't have the opportunity often to go into those communities and ask them what's important. Um, they are stuck in Canberra. Um, they will, you know, I think that they would, um, well, I'm probably digging a deep hole here, but I think they'd probably agree that that happens a lot, is that they just don't have the opportunity to go out. And therefore, they're looking to us for the answers because we have that opportunity to go out. Mm -hmm. um, anybody from Canberra wish to provide an alternative or supporting response to that? David's worked in Canberra. I'm going to decline to answer on the grounds that it may incriminate me. However, I don't disagree with what you've said. Um, yes, I have worked in Canberra. I spent 20 odd years there. My, when I first went to Canberra, um, we had, I was working in an evaluation team and we had a a seminar where they were getting some results from an evaluation. And there was a long debate about one of the findings, which was that um, a number of women claimed that they were working part time. And, and that was the word that was used, claimed that they were working part time. Because they, it, it took, after about 20 minutes, I asked them, what did they mean by part time work? And they said something, I can't remember the exact numbers, but 15 to 20, 15 to 30 hours a week. And I pointed out that if I had a part-time job as a cleaner, cleaning a house for four or five hours a week, I'd see that as part-time work. And they, um, they just couldn't grasp the concept until I said it, put it like that. I'm not sure they did grasp the concept ever. So, yes, I do think there is a cultural divide between um, the lives and the lived experience of many people in Canberra and those particularly on Indigenous, um, in Indigenous communities. Mm. Although I'm going to be kind and say that I think it's partly because they don't have that opportunity to go out and meet with people. And that's certainly what we hear from communities is, you know, why don't, why don't you know, these people from Canberra just come and visit us? And, and even the same with state and territory, particularly state officials, they don't often have the opportunity to go out and see what's happening on the ground either. They probably would love to. So I don't know what the big deal is. But I think we could solve a lot of problems by getting people in relationship. It's all about care and um, collaboration.
Oh, I have one last slide. And here I just want to say um, a, um, a huge thank you to Amy who has um, nurtured my interest in criteria and co-authored, as you can see, all three of those articles. So if you're interested in reading more, um, check out the blog, which is the top one, or the two articles. If you can't access any of them, uh, just let me know. I'm happy to send them to you.